liebe Kolleginnen, liebe Kollegen, liebe Burda Forwarder an den Screens, herzlich willkommen zu den nächsten, zu der nächsten Themenserie der Border Forward Future Talks. In den nächsten Wochen und Monaten wollen wir uns des Themas AI und Big Data annehmen. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass wir heute hier John Paul Schmetz begrüßen dürfen. John Paul Schmetz ist Chief Scientist der Uber Border Media und er wird uns eine so ein bisschen mal eingehen auf die Grundlagen des Machine Learnings, äh, viele spannende Anwendungen zeigen. Ich freue mich, dass du hier bist, John Paul, und ich übergebe das Wort an dich. I'll do it in English because I really don't know how to do it in German. Even if you speak German, it's not fair. Um, so what I want to do today is to give you really basic intuitions about machine learning. Machine learning is basically what works in artificial intelligence. It has a bunch of other things that are possible, but they don't really work. And machine learning is what uh, is actually work, uh, working. Um, and we're going to go from the 1960s to last weekend in terms of um, applications that have been announced. And really, the last few weeks have been incredible with what started to work. Uh, but the intuition for all of this started in the, um, in the 60s. I will not be able to prove everything I say, because you don't want me to start to prove it. Um, uh, but you can take my word for it, and I will try to have you really understand what, what the basic thing is. And I'll try to go quick so we have time for Q&A. So first, some of you, or most of you, probably have heard of linear regression uh, in school. So you try to predict the price of uh, flats in Munich based on the square meters. Then you put a bunch of points on the, you know, on the coordinate system, and you try to fit a line uh, that minimizes the error. Uh, and what works for that in school, you probably did it um, using matrices and inverted matrices, etc. But what works is something called gradient descent or backpropagation, which is that you, you you give random parameters to your equation, and then you see how far it is and what the derivative is, and you go in the opposite direction until the line, like in this little video, just starts to move and then finds the best positions. Okay, so now you've just done one new run of a very simple system that tries to have one input, one output, input square meters, output, um, the price of the flats. Now, you can create uh, much more interesting functions like the one on the left if you start to have more neurons you start to not have linear regression but something called a sigmoid which is just basically a very simple function that does like an s curve uh, and you try to learn all of these w's uh, that you see on the screen and you learn it the same way right so you use random w's you see what's up on the other side in terms of error then you back you back propagate in the derivative and go and change these w's in the opposite direction of the error. So if you if you imagine the error as a lot of kind of like mountains, you're basically trying to always go down, right, until you reach uh, the lowest points in the landscape. Um, and if you put a lot of neurons together, you can basically approximate any function you can imagine in any dimension level you can imagine. Right. So if you just go for apartments, it's very easy square meter location, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can start to have much more interesting representation of data. So for example, on the left side, this is text. So instead of using the words, you create so-called embeddings, which are basically lists of numbers that represents where the, not where the word is in space. And you do it in such a way that helicopter and plane and drones are all in the same space. So things that are similar are in the same space. So share the same numbers. Uh, and things that are dissimilar are completely in a different world. Right. Or in the right, this is for images. Basically, as you can see the little thing rotating. It always takes nine pixels. And so it creates one con convolution is called uh, and then just takes all of these little parts of images and just use them to input into the neural network. Like there's no limit to how creative you can be about how you embed stuff, but it seems that in, um, in text, this is better to do it in space like this and in um, images is better to do convolution. Okay, something a problem? No. No, no. So, someone asked uh, regarding the presentation function. 
Um, and so when you start to instead use one number, but you use list of numbers as the input and the output, obviously the math becomes a bit more complicated, but it's the same thing, right? Instead of dealing with normal uh, equation, you're dealing with matrices, but you've done matrices. Uh, by the way, this is why NVIDIA is so valuable, right? Because the GPUs can do very well in matrix multiplication. They can also do crypto stuff. So all of the new stuff is basically done by these big GPUs. So as a checkpoint, so now we have the ability to turn anything on the left, images, text, sounds, everything you want, you can turn it into numbers. Then you put, put a bunch of neurons, but really by a bunch, I mean billions, right? Um, and you try to learn by using enormous amount of data that you throw in and there. You try to learn, I don't know, is there a cat in this picture? Uh, what is this picture about? Can you predict the next word that this person is going to say based on the last five words that this person has said, et cetera, et cetera. So this is machine learning up to 2017, right? Mostly used for classification, that sort of thing, prediction. Um, and I remember the moment where that happened, actually, you know, we, at Stanford, there was a project on ImageNet where you would put an image and the computer would say, this is a cat jumping on a ball or something. Um, and then Fei Fei Li, the professor says, okay guys, let's do the opposite now, right? You write the text, the computer makes the image. Uh, and everyone said, ah, <laughs> come on, that, that's just not possible. And I'm going to show you why it's possible and actually how this is being done. So the, that's the level four, if you want. So it, you, all of you have a phone, and if you type a word, it tries to predict the next word. Or sometimes it tries to correct the word you just written. But uh, so this is very simple to do, right? You you create a so-called language model, which is basically statistics about if I type how did, what are the most likely three words that in all of the text that the computer has read, which is most likely the whole internet, uh, what will happen, right? And here it says you, I, and the, right? Uh, that's okay, that's easy to do with pre-2017 uh, machine learning. Uh, it's not very efficient because as you know, in language, you, it's just not the last word, it's probably the last 20 words or even the last 200 words that you have said determines what is most likely actually coming up. Your phone doesn't usually do that. Um, and so maybe I can show you GPT-3 before I explain to you how it's built. So this is part of the, this is a bit small, can I try to? So this is the state of the art when it comes to language models, so-called large language models. So these are machines that have read the entire internet from beginning to end um, and have sort of computed all the statistics, et cetera. And so you can chat with it, right? So you can say, I cannot predict what it will do, right? Uh, so sometimes it's quite surprisingly good and sometimes it's not so good, but let's see. But oh, so should I read it out? Yeah. So, so I ask, uh, I'm good, are we living in a simulation? There's no way to know for certain whether or not we are living in a simulation. Some people believe that this is possible that we are living in, in a simulated reality, what other things it's unlikely. Until we have more evidence, it's impossible to say for sure. So sometimes this machine says, yeah, sure, we are definitely living in a situation. So, <laughs> anyway. so I ask who created the simulation? Uh, now, now it's looping, so it's not really great. <laughs> Uh, so not not a good example. Ask him, ask him, ask him for the red pill or the blue pill. <laughs> oh come on! This is not a good demo. <laughs> try it. Sometimes it gets completely crazily good. Um, let's try something else. So 
can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Is there some context awareness uh, for more than just the last question I asked? So can I somehow really build a conversation and the AI yeah. is aware of what I said three steps? So aware of pretty much everything. Okay. Uh, and, and even stuff that you like, for example, let, let me try something uh, like a That should hopefully work. So it can speak pretty much anything you want, right? Uh, or if I say, um, um, let's try to find something silly. Um, Sometimes it doesn't understand if the, the letter is in German or, or the TV advertising. I mean, you, you can do kind of crazy stuff with it and, and you can uh, precondition the network. So you can say this is an example of what I want. So one person that I saw that this is a contract written by lawyer. This is what it means. This is another contract. This is what it means. And then you feed in a new contract and it tells you what it means in simple language. Uh, that, that kind of stuff is, is totally possible. Um, yeah, so I mean, we can, I can show you other stuff, but just basically you imagine that this is a, a machine that can talk and can look surprisingly intelligent. And if you pre configure it correctly, surprisingly uh, talk to tools uh, because it, it can also check Google and double check if it's in Wikipedia or not. Uh, and now I'm going to show you how to build this, basically. So, oh, this was the legal stuff. stuff. Um, so basically, that's the examples that you give the machine to uh, as what you want. And then this is what it does when you feed in real uh, contracts. This, this is quite amazing when you play with it. And this is only GPT-3. GPT-4 is coming probably in the next few weeks. Um, and, and it's going to also bring it to another level. So I want to teach you a little bit how uh, this is being built. Um, so if you want to predict the word that is on the red, on the little question mark, uh, you have to realize, I mean, you could try with a big network, right? Uh, just feed all the words on one side and then you do all the calculation and then you hope that red comes out. It turns out that it doesn't work very, very well to do it indiscriminately like this because you need to understand that bed is really important for this red because it needs to rhyme. And obviously the last three words are pretty important as well, but the rest is not important. Um, and so what, um, what is, the infrastructure that was built in 2017 called Transformer is a neural network, so same as what we saw before, but one uh, level is, is worrying about the attention. So on what part of the input should the model be very, careful about and what part not, and then the prediction of the next one. But it works the same way, meaning when you train it, if it turns out that it's trying to get brown, then the model will say, no, that's wrong. Uh, bed needs to be upgraded in its importance uh, because clearly there's a disconnect there between the output and the input. Um, and GPT-3 has 96 levels of these. So just like in the normal uh, neural network, the more you go towards the middle of the network, the more you start to see that the model has learned interesting things. Like if it's about pictures, it learns about certain shapes uh, that are not in the pixels that you give in. If it's about words, it learns about certain concepts that are not really necessarily in the words that you input. And here in the middle, you have some real semantics uh, coming in. Um, uh, so transformers, which is the architecture from 2017 onwards, have brought the concept of attention uh, to the forefront of neural network. And it seems that it, it's basically working in every field, uh, not only language. That essentially the, the models have to pay attention to certain things and learn what is important, what is not important before they try to make the prediction. And then you create a very complex network, I guess. But it's the same intuition as the first 
uh, linear regression that we looked at, right? It's the same way of training them, etc. You just need an awful lot more time and an awful lot more data and an awful lot more computing. And GPD-4 is coming uh, very soon. So now, this is something called DALI. Um, so if I enter this sentence on top, so an impression is painting of Van Gogh smiling, sitting at a lighted table, wearing a baseball hat, looking very chill in the style of Van Gogh. This is what the machine basically creates. Uh, I just prepared a few before. Uh, Wolves and Bears by pa Pablo Picasso. Right? <laughs> um, this is uh, a post-apocalyptic New York City landscape after a nuclear war, beautiful radioactive sunset. Little painting, Fallout 7, 6, painted by Albert Pierstadt. And this is what the machine does. Right? And it does an infinite amount of them. Uh, well, this is a website where you can see, for example, I typed album covers and it does album covers. Just, you know. uh, or this one is a river winding through a small village in the style of March comes like a lion stylized by Van Gogh. And it creates these images basically infinitely. Whether it's a painting or a photo, it doesn't really matter. How uh, long does it take? Called seconds, like seconds. Do you have something that you would like to see? I'm to be creative. Prompt design, by the way, so the design of these sentences has become a science by itself, right? Yeah. It's very difficult to come up with something. Lucy, do you have an idea? Tell me what you want to say. Human riding on a cat. What? Human riding on a cat. And you want it in a specific style or just like that? Let's just do let's just like Kagal that. style. So let's wait. <laughs> this is not this is another one, but now it's calculating and you see the little thing going. <laughs> so there's different, you know, uh, and if you click generate again, you will get four more pictures. Right? Yeah. So it doesn't take, it takes seconds, basically. Because once the model is trained, uh, you know, training takes years and, and many, many millions of dollars. Uh, but, uh, well, sometimes the cat is riding on the human, right? So, so these yeah. are semantical things that are not. Uh, but I will show you uh, examples later that are uh, people using creatively uh, basically automated prompt design and the pictures that come out of it, for example, in interior design. So Dali is just made public. Yeah, is it? Uh, just the last. So you can register actually and use it and you can even download Charlie, which is on your on your computer. So I'm going to teach you how this is actually made. So the first uh, versions of that for party by Google was that they decided that a picture was worth a thousand words. And so a 32 by 32 is actually 1024. So it's almost a thousand words. Uh, and they give each pixel a specific value from zero to 8,000 based on what the pixel should look like. Um, and then they basically turn the picture into a text, like, a, like, like, like what we saw with, uh, uh, with GPT-3. So if you wanted to do squirrel reaching for a nut, it would start to output 11111111666, and this attention would go around the red circle to try to complete the picture. Right? And then it basically created something like this, which when rendered, because then you have another step that tries to render us what it looks like, basically it comes up with that. Right. Um, but it can do more, obviously, like you can say reaching for not underwater, and this is what would come out. Uh, or you do it with toothpicks, et cetera, and that's what would come up, right? So basically these transformer were basically speaking suddenly not just English or German or Python, they were speaking numbers that represents images so same concept right? nothing different it, it really starts sounding like magic but i can tell you there's nothing different into it and i'll show you one example from tesla uh, and on just last friday using the same uh, page then more recently there's been something called latent diffusion models which are um, on top of transformers, and they are quite interesting as well. So on the one on the left side, you have very easy random images. You just put pixels of any colors you can figure out. That's easy to generate those. Generating pictures of raspberries is difficult. 
right? Um, so these are two different sets of images. But you can easily go from raspberries to random by just adding random noise into the picture. You know, let's say in 50 steps, right? Every step you add a little bit of random noise and then you end up in a random image on the left side. So now if you take these little things, you can train neural network to sort of reverse the arrows. Right, so, so you go from easy to, well, you go from a beautiful picture to a very easy picture by taking a bunch of easy steps, but you teach a model that basically reversing these steps would actually go back to the original image. Um, and that's what the diffusion neural network does. So, but you learn a lot of these things, millions and billions and billions of these things. And you connect it to a large language model like DPT that we just looked at. And so you can say, I want a Raspberry Beret, which is a song from Prince from many, many years ago. And the machine comes up with this, <laughs> <laughs> which is a picture that never existed, but is created from a random scene. Um, so basically, you start from noise to give it a direction, because if you would start from always the same picture, it would always probably end up in the same picture. But if you start from a different noise, it will end up in a different thing. This is really surprising that it works. Right? Um, and so now what, what can we do, right? You've seen image to text, text to image, you know, in text to 3D, this is, uh, you, you basically type what you want and instead of just doing an image, it does the 3D model that you can put into a game or something. So this is a lot of teams are working on doing second 3D. Same concept, right, as the rest. Uh, uh, Facebook or Meta just announced text to video last week. So this is the prompt. This is the video that comes out. Um, and you can see a bunch of the, the test, uh, a bunch of examples on their web page at the moment. Um, you can do text to movement. So if you look at the body on the, on the right side, when I play the video and on the left side, you see this random noise, right? So if they're making a, like you will see the body moving completely randomly, but then not so much. We present MDM, a diffusion-based model for human motion generation. So it moves completely randomly and then starts to move like a human. MDM and is a flexible framework for human motion generation, like delivering a large span of possible motion. This is obviously super important for robots. With intuitive control, natively allowing text to motion generation, robot, action to motion generation, to editing, and more, while making you can turn a picture into a video. So these are all the diffuse model plus transformer, right? They're always using the same general architecture. Uh, uh, that was from last Friday when Tesla did this AI day and what they showed was they learn to speak the lane language. So if you arrive at an intersection, which was here at the bottom right, it mapped all of the routes that are possible for the cars to take, but it's a language. So they call it the language of lanes. And basically uh, the, the, the language model gets an input, which is where I am now, et cetera. And then it predicts all of the possible curves that you can do from there that a, a road, a, a car can drive. Here, uh, text to sound. So the prompt is this thing with wind blowing. So this is all artificially generated based on, on text, basically. Uh, text to code, almost unsurprising <laughs> at this point. Um, so, so, so essentially, we have uh, what's going on a lot now is people combining these models. So for example, this thing is called this house does not exist which is uh, someone who feeds um, GPT-3, uh, like create a lot of description of houses and then DALI creates the houses. And it's obviously infinite, right? Um, or you have the same with, uh, what was this? Here you can even upload a picture of your room and it will just create uh, infinite variations of it. So you upload the picture and then it basically creates like, and you can say I want it bohemian or modern, et cetera, and it will just basically. So this is anyway, you can play with this if, uh, 
Dali to Dali with uh, yeah okay so you take uh, this this um, this prompt and you just figure out like you just say okay I want this painter to do it or that painter and it basically creates infinite variation of the thing in the style of that. Um, so obviously now you 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 know we, w these models by the way when they are trained so they they take millions of dollars to train there are many teams that are always bring down like first it's like 20 million dollars then it's 500 thousand then it's 50 thousand and then it always goes down but then there's a new one coming up later uh, but once they are trained you can just download them they're four gigabytes and Dali well not Dali but one stable diffusion which is a competitor to Dali uh, runs on my Mac without any problem. And, and you can create mini GPT-3s that are almost as good as GPT-3 and run them on your cell phone or something. Um, and so learning how to prompt them has become a kind of new science. I mean, it's kind of interesting to see like, okay, how do you tell this machine what to do and, and uh, hopefully it works. Um, and so new models and architecture, they're coming up every, like you saw with Transformer was 2017. Uh, Diffusion models probably 2020, 21. Um, and then they go really quickly and people just embrace them, try to train them. And every company does them, right? So you have one version by, or one or two version by Google, one or two version by Meta, one or two version by OpenAI. Um, and, and very quickly, there's one guy, usually Andre Capati, a friend of mine, who just basically just recode them so you can run it by yourself on your machine and understand them. Um, and so the, this is really going super quick. And that's it, right? I mean, basically, the, the more you can think about how to represent uh, something that you want, like using vectors like Lane by Tesla or uh, Fei Fei Lino is doing uh, at Stanford, all of the 1,000 movements that humans do not like to do for some reason, and uh, teaching them to these models so they can be taught to robots to do. So they have like a ranking of 1,000 things humans hate doing and try to teach robots to do it. Um, but the models are getting, uh, you know, with the architectures are getting super solid. So, so really from super basic stuff like almost linear regression to this, there is, it's quite surprising that there's no much, uh, not much difference. And that's it. So now we can do questions. I hope I didn't speak too long. Yeah, great. I think there are questions in the audience. I, I could start um, with the questions because we saw a lot of creation of pictures and so on. And in my mind, uh, I, I first thought of deep fake and how, how it can be abused. Uh, is there already some sort of algorithm to detect uh, sure. a, a generated uh, AI? photo video and whatever software which so most, yes yes and no but uh, the first thing that that you will find out when you play with these things is that it is fairly difficult to use people in it because the models themselves do not accept them so so dali will tell you no i'm not doing that so, so there are i guess ethicists or people working in these companies that basically just limit these models but obviously since you can download the model you can do whatever you want uh, on your computer uh, is it possible to detect if they are created by machines? Probably, um, but you know, for how long? I don't know. Like, like take the text for example. I don't think you can detect if it's written by, you know, because you, you, what you will do, right? If you let's say you want to write a paper um, or a contract or whatever, you will hit repeatedly until it comes out the way you like to have it. Uh, so I don't think there's going to be much of a way to detect it. There was a study just a few days ago on the website of Tify and also, which said that the perception of users in automated text is better than uh, the yeah. perception of text which is written by editors. It's you know you have a machine that has read every single text that has ever been written and has figured out how the texts are constructed and work, right? So, so it's not. Uh, it's not wrong to expect that machine to be pretty good at it. But the truth, obviously, like because we always tend to say like quality of, so this is much better to write a novel 
than to write an article about something factual, right? Because uh, the machine doesn't really care about facts or has a very sort of fuzzy notion about facts, right? Or even in art, like if you say, oh, I want a woman diving in a pool, um, you know, wearing a bikini, the, the, it's not impossible that the woman ends up having three legs. Right? <laughs> we have this in the chat, we can repeat this. There was one, uh, Dennis asked for a three leg human. Human. Well, you don't have to even oh, say I, that. Sometimes <laughs> they come out with three legs, but yeah, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I have a I question didn't... about the rights management. For example, um, if I downloaded one of the album covers and um, put it on my album and it was really successful, whose picture is it? Can I just use it for free? I think you can. I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I mean, first of all, uh, if you use your own, let's say, Charlie, which is a downloadable software and you generate something, you can surely use it. If you use OpenAI, which is hosted, uh, I think you use you can use it because you have to buy credits to use their computers. Uh, so how I think you can. But honestly, you know, if if Dali has copied it for you know, like like you always have this thing like with music, right? Like you can, um, a, a lot of musicians have created hits, and then suddenly someone came and said, "Wait a minute, this sounds like my song," which the musician probably heard twenty years before, and it was kind of in the brain. You know, so that kind of thing is obvious could happen, right? Where, where the computer was a bit too inspired by something that exists. I have a question um, about the, the training. Basically, uh, what I learned is that in AI, the quality of the training data is very, very important. Yeah. There was an example some years ago, Microsoft put on a, a yeah. chatbot that um, in a couple of days turned out to be very, very racist and, and yeah. maybe sexist too. So, and they had to, to spread it was everything. So uh, is, is this something that's uh, yeah, yeah. So, now or how is the situation? Well, I now? mean, what happened with Microsoft was very interesting because uh, I mean, a friend of mine was the CEO of Microsoft. I owned the head of all artificial intelligence and he told me the real story. So what they did is they trained it in China and Japan uh, in social media where people are extraordinarily polite. And so that worked very well. Uh, until they brought it to the US and trained it on Twitter, where people are notoriously not polite. <laughs> and the machine learned what it had to learn, like how to be an asshole on Twitter was essentially what the machine learned, right? And, and that, that went in all bad directions. And so obviously training data is always absolutely critically important. And in fact, a lot of the research doesn't go too much into the models anymore, like transform a little bit, of course, but in, in how to generate good data for training. Because if you're lucky, you have the data. But at this point, this is not really uh, the case anymore. So, so because all of that data has already been used once, right? So now how do you generate really good data? Uh, so for example, OpenAI came out with Whisper two weeks ago, which is a very strong a speech to text a transcription uh, algorithm. And everyone believes that they use that to be able to use all of what people speak in YouTube uh, as an additional text input mm -hmm. to learn how people speak. Uh, and so, you know, and in Vietnam, I know companies with 20,000 people that are just preparing data for this Tesla or Toyota, etc., to, to have really good input data to train these models. Because if you make a mistake like Microsoft and you don't think about the fact that Twitter is different from some random Japanese social network, it's, it's the machine will learn something, right? Yeah. And it's sometimes like in the in these um, cancer detection thing. Uh, at one point, they did one that was so good, but then they realized that the training set there was a pixel that was different from the positive case from the negative case, and the machine simply learned to look for that pixel. Mm -hmm. So they thought that it was working, but it wasn't really working. So yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, critical. And a lot of effort goes into that. I have another question about dedicated hardware. You, you mentioned uh, GPUs are very well suited for doing the kind of you know, simple calculations you need for these neural networks. Uh, in the smartphone area, and I think it's also coming to the desktop computers, the 
SOCs, the system on the chip, they, they use, they have a dedicated hardware for machine learning for the called NPU or Bionic with Apple or whatever. So what's your opinion on that? Is this really helpful? Is it going to yes, grow? because because basically what you're going to have is a series of multiplication of, of vector and matrices in both mm -hmm. directions, but but mostly in the like what, when you have the model. And you're going to try to make your prediction in a milliseconds like Tesla does, or, or you know, when they decide the car is going to take a little bit left or a little bit right. Uh, what's going on is there's a bunch of numbers coming in, and then it's being multiplied by another vector, and then it becomes a matrix, and then the matrix gets multiplied, multiplied, and multiplied, and then there's an output. So you need hardware that can do this very well. And it turns out GPUs do that because you do the same thing when you create a game yeah. or something, or you're trying to project uh, a 3D space into 2D. So yeah, it's it's uh, you know specialized hardware is definitely better than just using your CPU. Tool. But it's not specialized specialized just for AI, right? It works as well for crypto because it turns out to be the same general problem. Yeah, it um, makes it some some simple intention. And, and it works very well for graphics, uh, which is also a very useful stuff on the phone. Uh, so yes, it's specialized, but it's. Not just for that. Online. Yes, we have a question from Tanya. And we come to the part here um, what's in it for Border Forward? And <laughs> so Tanya asked, uh, what uh, can our Border Forward teams do? Yeah. yeah, but I think, you, you know, this is a tool, right? That uh, just like, I guess, 25 years ago, when we started with the internet, uh, if you knew HTML, you could think about what's good, what, what is it good for focus, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit the same. It is is what uh, what could we use these models for? Uh, it's probably not going to be the obvious stuff. Like I don't think you're going to use GPT-3 to write articles, and you're not going to use Dali to create pictures to these articles. You could, but it's not going to be. I don't think it brings you forward. Uh, the, the question is, are there applications that we could do and offers to your users that could like, for example, this like just input a contract and you get an interpretation of the contract. Is that something that we could do for something similar? Right. Um, or, or do we create um, a, a model for calculating the, if the price of real estate is too high, too low? You know, there, there are things we can do when we look at the problems that we are solving for people that will use these tools, because if we don't use them, someone else will. And then you will have some startup that comes up and says, uh, we use AI and transformer to revolutionize some things that we used to do with text. Right. Um, so that's how I would look at it, that, that we have to, especially that it's so simple now, like five years ago, you would have to be in a university, you would have to have in the computers, but it's not the case anymore. Um, I have a question, or do you know the app PhotoMine? So it is uh, where you can upload um, old pictures of your childhood or something, and then um, they will do a small animation like you are smiling oh, yeah. or you you are doing. I think it's a little bit. Yeah, it uses these is, it, model with conditioning. Yeah. Uh, so you basically say the conditioning is this. This is my face. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, make me old, make me bearded, make me this, make me a woman. Yeah, or colored uh, uh, and, and everything. Put this woman and this man and then predict how the kids will look like. Yeah. Uh, all of that stuff exists and it's using exactly that. I, yeah. Yeah, I saw this and uh, with a colleague together, we, we thought also about our uh, guest uh, authors. Perhaps if we have uh, small pictures on in an app or a website and if they move a little bit, it can be look more uh, yeah, sympathetic time, perhaps pictures oh. into little videos where people do this yeah things. doing like this and it, it, but i think that but it's only a small a really a small small idea a small what what we can do with yeah, pictures so or something to answer tanya's question basically it's a tool mm -hmm. and some people are really good at seeing tools and and coming up with applications mm -hmm. and other people look at it and see nothing right mm -hmm. so so uh, when I was a kid and I saw coding, I was like, oh, we can do so many things. And all the people were like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's the same with this, right? So you need to make sure that in the company, there are people who see these tools and say, oh, I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, I could do that. And then sort of see what the users would like to have. 
you find interesting, right? Whether it's a gadget like see yourself, how you're going to age, or uh, whether it's super useful, maybe with the interior decoration kind of inspiration. One thing it can do is can definitely be inspiring, right? Because you hit generate and it gives you like totally different ideas. Uh, so you could be, I don't know, like in Xing, we could have like a career predictor, right? It says you could be this and this and that, and you'll read it, and, no, I don't like it. And you hit generate again, boom, you're a completely different life. And it gives you all the steps that you should definitely do to get there. I mean, it's, it's, but the technology is really a tool. So if you have no one that can use them, then you're not going to be able to make something out of it. Uh, if you have people who are playing with them, eventually something will come out. Or they just go out and make a startup. <laughs> hey, Dion, this is, I mean, companies are, are good. They have a lot of data. So for Tesla, it's using it for, for traffic. Google is using it for search and so on. And Facebook is using it for the social analysis and doing something with social. So we, where do we have a lot of data? But I think there's we two ways to use the data. So we, we could but do something with it. I mean, there's two ways to see this. First of all, these models incorporate all of the data they report there. And so you can do what, I forgot what the word is in, in machine learning, but basically you take a huge model that does a bunch of things, and then you put a little bit of data on top to make it do one thing very, very well, which is a little bit like this contract stuff. It doesn't take much, but you, you start from your application, you take a general model, in paint picture, create audio, or whatever, right? Whatever you need. And then you condition it by using data that we could collect, we could make, we could buy, uh, and then we make it do something really well, a specialist way. Or you, if that's not possible, then you have to start from the application layer and say, I want to do something and therefore I need to get the data, which is, you know, search, by the way, is the first sort of, you know, 20 years ago, uh, search was a magic thing that you could type a few words and it would just give you everything, right? And, and you needed a lot of data. And so at, when we started Clicks, we just went out and bought the data that we needed. And then later we found ways to create the data that we needed. Um, so if you start from the application layer, always look, is there a model that exists that you can use to sort of, you know, condition to do what you want you to do? And most likely you will find one, I think, in these days. So that's what Tesla did with the lane stuff. They use a general language model and then condition it to do a specific task of choosing a lane or determining what is a lane. Um, and I guess the first people who did these pictures at party in Google, there was probably a small team that says, let me use something like GPT-3 or whatever the Google equivalent was and try to create a picture with it. But they didn't start by collecting all the pictures in the world. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to start from what do we want to do with it and be a bit over optimistic and then have some people in the company saying like, what can I use to, to do that? But being inspired by all of these people turning language model into things that you would never expect that they could do. I don't think we should start from our own data because we think we have a lot of data but it is nowhere near what we and then you find out that if you need to start one of these models from scratch, you don't have enough money. OpenAI is a one billion dollar company. I mean, they got one billion from Elon Musk and then one billion from Microsoft on top. I mean, we're not going to be able to compete against that. And that's a charity, right? So they set yes. up as a can, can you a little bit elaborate on it? Because when you start thinking about this, you hear about these big companies and then OpenAI. Yeah, okay. Tell a little bit about that. Well, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence were always sort of considered to be a dream that was not really, really possible for decades. So it was always difficult to get finances as a as a um, uh, artificial intelligence company. And some of the big of the big names like OpenAI basically became a foundation at first that was saying if it works, we're going to make it available to everyone. So this is uh, GPT-3, DALI, et cetera. You had companies like DeepMind, which were basically just a bunch of researchers, like the smartest of them all, selling themselves in a building in London. And then Google bought them. Um, 
when it became clear that these kind of talents were super important. Um, and then you have basically the usual guys with big research budgets like Google, Microsoft, Data, I guess Tesla, and, and, and these people, right? Um, and they hire all the people coming out of school that know how to do these things, and they just do stuff. Um, some of it is being used, obviously, in products, but not that much, right? Because you, you, why isn't GPT-3 in your phone? Why is it still predicting the next word based on the previous word and gets totally confused sometimes between languages and stuff like that? So obviously the technology has not arrived yet. Even if it's done by the Googles of this world, it's still not completely in Android. But it's clear that you have some people like Zuckerberg and, and Larry Page, etc., who understand, and Elon Musk, who understand that this is definitely the future and just put tons of money behind it. And do this relatively publicly. I mean, it's quite amazing how much you can see of this thing. Like everything is written down, everything is well, everything is available to try, but you can read the paper on how it's built. Question on you elaborated on 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 these uh, Western based companies. Yeah. Well, how about China and other well, they, big companies? You know, Baidu and, and Tencent, etc., are definitely all doing things. I don't think that they are more advanced. Uh, that they're not, not really advanced. And even Microsoft, for example, was doing these things in China, but before they were doing them in the rest of the world. So it's, I don't see, this is very much a US thing. Well, with the exception of DeepMind in, uh, in London. But if you listen to the presentation of Tesla AI, all of the people on stage all had an accent. Right? So, you know, you take the CTO of, uh, of OpenAI, I forgot the name, but I think she's Albanian. It definitely has, a, has, a, has an accent. So that's sort of the world. You have. Everyone has an accent, like very few people are Americans. So they're just buying all the people. From well, it goes through the universities, right? I mean, they tend to all end up in Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT, etc. And then from there, you get your, you know, your ten thousand dollars a month internship at Google. It's hard to, it's hard to get out of the train. We <laughs> have already right. examples of uh, projects inside Borda. Not with transformers, I don't think we, but this is 2017, right? And this is even Google doesn't use them. Well, I, I'm sure they use them somewhere <laughs> in advertising, like everything ends up in advertising at one point. But um, uh, so we still do it, let's say, with old fashioned, if at all, neural network. And I think we could do much better than that. Because, for example, one use of GPT-3, which is kind of fascinating, is that you can upload a PDF and then ask questions about the PDF. So you could say, this is an invoice I got. What's the invoice number? What's the amount I have to pay? Where do I have to pay it? And the machine is able to extract this information. And, and just a couple of years ago, there would be companies coming to us offering this service for like half a million. Right? GPT-3 can do it quite well. But you know how it is then. Huh? You bring it in and then people say, but what if it makes a mistake? And then they don't do it. They, they want it to be perfect before even looking at it, and then you don't do it. So there's not much in that. Let's say diffusion models I've never seen anywhere. Are you aware? You could uh, be the first. <laughs> I wanted to ask, are you aware of other publishing houses that use uh, the more modern type of AI already, and in which way they No, in, if you define publishing houses in the traditional way, Gruner and Yar, Spiegel, etc. Or media companies, TikTok, for example. Well, they yeah. use it to to predict. I mean, their their recommendation engine is is absolutely stupefying, right? Mm -hmm. And so it must use the same sort of. So I don't know the inside of it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a transformer, which predicts not the next word but the next video. Mm -hmm. It pays attention to not just the last one you saw, but but the whole history. The whole history and has a way of saying, well, yeah, this one not so much, but this one definitely. So I would definitely imagine that we start. We could do it otherwise. 
every recommendation system has to have this ability to determine which which article or whatever you saw before was important to you and which not. Right? If not, you just try to predict based on everything at equally weight, that, and that just doesn't or you end up just predicting based on the last one. So I guess what we do, or even Outbrain, etc. You have one article, and then you try to predict the one based on that one. It's a little bit like with text, uh, your form trying to predict the next word based on the previous word. It's okay, right? But it's not much better. It's not the best. The recommendation system, advertising system, for sure. It's not really super fascinating to to do artificial intelligence in advertising, but I'm sure it's done. <laughs> we have explanation why some recommendation systems are pretty bad. If I look at Netflix, for example, or Amazon yes. Prime or others, they try to sell me the same thing again and again. And then well, it depends. Why are they? It's, it's, um, it depends what you try to optimize, because every recommendation system that you do has to optimize some kind of thing in the end. And a lot of them, unfortunately, try to optimize for CTR, so flex. And they all go in the same path of, of trying to, to give you the most shocking, the most thing that you're going to click, right? If you optimize for retention, like, for example, Apple News is doing, that, that's different. A different approach. And Netflix is, is tricky because Netflix definitely invented recommendation engine. They even financed a huge price in 2006 with every single person in this world trying, I mean, we knew recommendation system competing. And then they didn't end up using the system because it was not explainable to the user. So the user did not know why the recommendation was being made. Mm -hmm. That's why now they say, because you watch this, because mm -hmm. you watch that, because they learned that people actually prefer interpretability to the form of randomness. It's random. And then Netflix has the problem, of course, that um, well, they don't have an infinite recommendation space, right? Uh, they, they can only recommend what they have. Yeah. Some people it seems I've watched every second. <laughs> 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 Not me, but <laughs> I think at one point they run out of stuff. So, so every recommendation problem is a bit different. But they all should follow this thing, right? That, that Things you have watched at different weights, and you first have to learn to pay attention to the right thing before you make the recommendation. Just like uh, we could try that, transform it there, uh, try to train it. There's a question uh, from Luna uh, Virginio. Um, could you share? Uh, with us a list of interesting link resources to keep updated about the last trends in machine learning, generation tools, and free NPL schools. So I, I would I would simply recommend to follow a couple of Twitter people. Uh, one is Andres Kapati, K A R P A T I T H I. Um, he has been. He was at Stanford. He was at Tesla AI. He's pretty much open AI everywhere. And now he's an independent researcher. I'm not sure what that means. I think he's just doing whatever he wants. But he's one that is probably the best at just saying like this is important in this thing, and this is how you 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 code it in Python uh, by yourself or PyTorch or something. So he's a really good educator. He used to teach at Stanford too, and he's a good summer summarizer of what's going on. So if you follow him on Twitter, this is pretty good. And then you have different accounts that do like a weekly, it needs to be weekly, by the way, a weekly report of what's new in AI, that's what they call it. But if you search in Twitter, you can come up with it. Yeah. I find that Twitter is, is surprisingly good at, at keeping up with, but they all own it. Um, yeah. We will put the links in the chat, and also I can uh, announce one thing some people may have already noticed. Uh, all these talks are recorded, as you know, and we will, are now just uh, uploading them to YouTube, and we will all the, also put these things in the show notes on YouTube. So if you follow on YouTube Future Talks, uh, Border Forward, you can always watch every last uh, of the last talks and we will continue this in the future so. anyway and, and some more questions 
there was one question in the chat and what Jinyu asked if it's possible to share the slides presentation. You could also add this in, in the chat here and so everybody can read it. So thank you very much for first. This was the first part and we'll wrap this up here.